Let us pray. Ô Créateur, toi qui as fait toutes choses, ô Dieu, transforme notre monde en bénédiction et en bienfait. Donne-nous une parole vivante aujourd'hui. O God, who created all nature and constructed all things, with blessing and with good spirit, we pray you will transform us in our world and enlighten us with your living word in the power of the Spirit. Amen. This week, I was remembering back a decade or more when we at Rio Park were participating in a large social values survey through the United Church of Canada with the surveying work being done by Environics Research. The aim of the project was to give us an idea of what the social values were in the community around us, presumably so then that we could, pres we could gear our marketing, what marketing we have, towards the community more effectively. So I took a good look at the top 10 out of 100 values. These were things like cultural fusion and networking, flexibility in gender roles, the need for escape from stress, having some ecological awareness. Now some of those top 10 fit pretty well with our congregation. There were others that were in the top 10, like consumerism, rejection of tradition, not so much. Well, after that, I took a look at the bottom 10 values. And there I found some things that are really important to us as a church. Things like ritual and spirituality, awareness of our mortality, and family life. Wait a minute, I thought, family life? Why is that in the bottom? Because I've always thought of this neighborhood, of this community, as being quite family friendly. So to me, that didn't add up. When I took a more thorough look, however, through the whole list of social values, I found that there were actually two sets of values that fell under the family category. One of those sets was called primacy of the family, and it referred to the values that people place on the success and continuation of their family. The other group was called meaning of life through family. And this one was much more general, seeking the betterment of all families, passing on significant values and ethics to children, cultivating strong roots. Primacy of family, which means ensuring the success of your own family, that scored very high in the inventory. I think it was in the top 20. But the meaning of family, taking care of all families as a way of strengthening the whole community, that was in the bottom 10. I wasn't surprised to find religiosity and rejection of authority at the bottom of the list. That, that fits, with a lot of, uh, fits with the way that people perceive the church and religion in general in our society today. Faith communities are often perceived with either outright suspicion or apathy by the wider community around us. But finding out that family wellness, community roots, were at the bottom of that list, that shocked me. One of the things the United Church of Canada has named in its future planning is this notion of the common good. And just as society has been growing more and more individualistic in its values, so churches have been growing more and more competitive, or as we would say, congregationalist within our denominations. However, to survive in the future, we are taking another look at what it means to cultivate the common good for all communities of faith and not just our own congregation. A colleague of mine described a situation he knew well it was an inner city church, and it's not in Ottawa, so don't start speculating. 
It was a congregation that was experiencing the particular kind of decline that happens in city churches when most of the families move out to the suburbs. Even with the best music, the best preachers, the best programming, even with large uh, reserve funds and endowment funds, many inner city churches have had to close their doors or to be sold, not because of a financial problem, but mainly because of the lack of people. And that's what was happening with this congregation that my friend was telling me about. They increased their concerts. They did all kinds of membership campaigns. They looked into property redevelopment. They hired um, a, a bunch of consultants. The one bright light that they discovered on their horizon was that in the city there was a small ethnic non-English congregation that had ties to the United Church. It had started up in the city and was looking for a place to worship, and it was growing. So the two congregations came to an agreement. The historic congregation moved their worship time a little earlier. The ethnic congregation had a place to hold a Sunday morning worship, and they also had a bit of office space. Their congregation were residents from all over the city. So the inner city worked well for them because most of them came to church on the bus. So it should have been the perfect solution. But the historic congregation kept raising the rent. And then they asked the other congregation not to use the kitchen on Sunday morning because it was too crowded. And then they complained because the other group left musical instruments in the, in the choir loft. And eventually the other congregation said, well, we don't really feel welcome here. And they found somewhere else to put down their roots and to keep growing. Eventually the historic church had to close down. Even though it had lots of money, there just wasn't any life left in it. Now... If we in our denomination are to start making the common good one of our priorities, how would that value inform a situation like this one? What if the rental arrangement was based on the hope that one day the new congregation would take over the ministry of the historic one? What if they had more of a rent-to-own agreement? What if the historic congregation saw its ministry as supporting the new ministry and the new congregation respected and built on the rich history of ministry there? It's easy to speculate and to judge them because we aren't talking about our church. What would it mean if Rideau Park started making the, the common good a priority in our future planning? The Apostle Paul wrote those words in his letter to the Philippian church that Helen read a moment ago. Put yourself aside and get, let others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourself long enough to lend a helping hand. It's from the translation by Eugene Peterson, which is called The Message, and the language is pretty plain when we read it. This was the mind of Christ Jesus. If you call yourself Christian for his name's sake, then you should have the same mindset. Putting away your own privilege and helping one another is what Jesus would have you do. By this time, Paul was in prison in Rome. He was humbled in spite of the fact that he was a Roman citizen and should have had more privileges. But he was imprisoned because he sought the common good for all followers of Jesus. And it didn't matter what their nationality was or what their status in society was. And that seemed to rub the Roman Empire the wrong way. So it struck home to him in prison that sometimes it is worth giving something up in order to achieve something greater for all God's children. Again, these words are taken from the description of Jesus in his letter to the Philippians. Jesus had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what. Having become human, Jesus stayed human. 
It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life, and then he died a selfless, obedient death. For Paul, who was in prison, this vision of following Jesus just made sense to him. He wasn't advocating some kind of self-sacrifice or self-denial. Instead, he wanted people to take advantage of any hopeful situation when it arose. Taking advantage of an opportunity to spread the gospel and to strengthen all in the spirit of Christ. Now, I don't know whether it was because the Apostle Paul traveled from place to place to place, but he held all those seedling starter communities that he had visited. He understood them all to be equal in God's sight. We know that he had his favorites. We know that he really loved the Philippians and that the Ephesians gave him a headache. We know he had a second home with Lydia in Macedonia, and we also know that he probably wanted to strangle the leaders at Corinth from time to time. But still, he never set those congregations up in competition with one another. Instead, he told all of them to empty themselves so that they could help one another. For the long t longest time now, the United Church has known that we have too many buildings. And we have buildings that are too expensive for our members to support. Or that sometimes we have two or three buildings serving the same neighborhood, and they compete for members. The pandemic dealt a hard blow to many of those congregations across Canada. And many of those smaller congregations especially closed their doors for good. Unfortunately, the closures happened without any real planning or strategy about what next steps might be in that place. Just because the building closed, did that mean that ministry stopped in the community? Or did those churches pass resources on to another neighboring congregation to continue their ministry, or even to another denomination that was in that place? One of my colleagues speculated that being, going through the pandemic would push us to be more post-congregational. And we created what we call the Southeast Ottawa Cluster in hopes of sharing rather than comparing, in hope of embodying rather than imploding. It just might be all of us have to give up something in order to build a healthier whole church, which is much more effective in the future. So if you look at that fishy diagram that's on the cover of the bulletin, you'll notice that the common good is at the tail of the fish. And that doesn't mean it comes last, but it provides, like a rudder on a ship, the steering and the correction that we need to swim upstream right now together. Like that environic survey, we know that churches are different from the culture around us. We're countercultural sometimes. We give when others take. We empty out when others hoard. We hope when others criticize. And all of this is because we are trying to have the same mind in us that was in Christ Jesus, emptied out for love, yet creating new life in every ending. So thanks be to God.